My name is Jim Al Khalili, and I'm a professor of physics at the University of Surrey, and I'm involved with this new exhibit, Schrodinger's Cat on a Silicon Chip. I should come clean and say that I'm a theoretical physicist, so I deal with equations, blackboards, computers, writing programs. I'm now like a, a, a fish out of water to some extent because I'm in a, in a research lab, uh, a laser lab. And one of the beautiful things about powerful lasers today is that they can be used to manipulate atoms. And they, it's the lasers that we use, almost like tweezers, or, or that can pump energy into atoms and manipulate them. So the atoms that we, we are working on in our research are atoms that can be controlled by zapping them with very, very precise laser beams. And, and I'm surrounded by the sorts of lasers that are used in this research today. A lot of people have heard of Schrodinger's cat. Owen Schrodinger was an Austrian physicist, one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, which is a theory that describes the subatomic world, the world of atoms and below. And it's a very strange theory. It's very powerful, but it's very counterintuitive. So Erwin Schrodinger in the 1930s came up with this thought experiment. He said, look, in quantum mechanics, atoms can do more than one thing at once. They can be in two places at once or two states at once. But a cat's made of atoms. So what if you put a cat in a box would you be able to force the cat to be two, in two states at once? And what he came up with was a rather evil idea. Of course, no cats were harmed in this experiment. It was just purely hypothetical. Uh, he said if, if, if a, an atom could be made to spit out a, a particle, if it was radioactive, within the space of an hour, so there's a 50-50 chance that it would have spat out, say, an alpha particle. Now, quantum mechanics says if you don't look to see what's happened, if you don't stick a Geiger counter to, to, to detect this particle, it's not just that you don't know whether it's spat out the alpha particle or not, but it's done both things at once. It's both spat it out and not spat it out at the same time. And at the quantum level, we sort of live with that. Schrodinger said, yeah, but if that alpha particle triggers the poison that might kill a cat in the box, then that cat is both dead and alive at the same time. And that's nonsense. We, we've now realized that quantum mechanics really is as strange as this. Uh, and, and, and physicists are trying to find very clever ways of using this notion, this idea of Schrodinger's cat being in more than one state at once, down at the subatomic level, to help design new ideas and technology. In our exhibit, rather than using a cat in a box, we're talking about individual atoms. Atoms that are uh, something like uh, or the element phosphorus, for instance, that can be placed on the surface of a silicon chip, and those atoms then exhibit this strange doing two things at once sort of behavior. Now, in our case, it's not like a cat being dead and alive. It's an atom existing in two different forms. We call them the ground state and the excited state. And the atom has a different shape depending on those two forms. The fact is the atom is not in one shape or the other. It coexists with both shapes at the same time, and that is allows it to somehow control other surrounding atoms and force them to do more than one thing at once. So it forces them to multitask. One of the, the holy grails in, in, in 21st century physics is to build a quantum computer. A quantum computer is not like any computer we've ever seen or had before. It's one that can pursue all possible options at once. It's the ultimate in parallel processing. We haven't got there yet. And we're trying to find clever ways of controlling the quantum world to allow us to design such a computer. So this is an important step along the way of reaching a quantum computer, allowing atoms to coexist in different states and talk to each other to form part of an integrated circuit, as it were, the sort of the, the fundamental um, building blocks of a computer, but down at the atomic level using quantum trickery. Quantum computers won't replace our standard laptops. They won't be able to, to do everything more efficiently or faster. But there are certain tasks that we believe a quantum computer could do much, much more quickly than a classical computer. For instance, a nice example I always think of is uh, you, you hear about these powerful computers that can play chess and even defeat grandmasters. Well, a quantum computer could pursue all possible moves at once. They say, well, if I move that pawn over there, that will happen, that will, that will happen. A classical computer will have to check out all outcomes, come back, 
check out all other outcomes of another move. A quantum computer could do all moves at once. In practice, we'll use quantum computers for sifting through large databases. We would use them for, um, for instance, cracking codes. Uh, th there are lots of specific tasks that they might have, but frankly, we haven't explored all these possibilities yet. In terms of how far we are away from building a quantum computer, well, that depends on who you talk to. There are certain researchers and even companies that claim that they have produced a quantum computer, albeit on a very basic level. There are many other scientists who are rather more skeptical that will ever be able to control the delicate quantum world and, and allow it to, to provide us with, with a, a working computer. You know, I would say, like a lot of these technologies that are in the future, maybe a decade or two from now, we'll be very close to reaching this dream. I'm quite optimistic that uh, certainly within my lifetime, I'll be using a quantum computer.